and then we kind of went back and forth. Well, you call me and you're like, hey, you bought this crack house around yeah. the corner. You want another one? Yeah. <laughs> that one's really bad down there. And so then I called him like, hey, you just bought this house down the road. That was a bad you one. you want to partner on yeah. this? And he's like, oh, I know right where that's at. And I was like, there's a big rock. I think I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, but ultimately we, we came to terms on it. Yeah, and the other good thing about, so like what we do, and we're different than most buyers, most investors are gonna say, if you wanna wholesale, like, hey, I'll pay you this, or you give it to them at a number, right? We do the same thing, but then we always offer for the wholesaler, like, hey, you can forfeit your fee, we'll buy it with you. We actually prefer not to do it that way, but we do it as like a, we, we want people to think of us first, because we want, um, and so it allows the wholesaler to share in the upside of the deal. Because the, the beautiful thing about wholesaling is, you sell the deal, you're done, you got your money, if the market crashes or something bad happens, you're out of the deal. The bad news is when the market rips, you leave a lot of money on the table. So it, uh, it allows you to, uh, to share in the upside, but you're basically putting up your wholesale fee as part of the deal. So on and, and that last deal, uh, you were gonna make like 20. And so he doubled his money on the last one we did. Um, we had actually gone back and forth with like, hey, if we do a little bit more uh, money into it, then we could get a little bit more on the outbound, but then at the end of the day, it's like, based on this size and scale, and what you'll see inside, it's like, James is like, we need to turn and burn on this thing. Like, Yeah, because that's the key is, and we'll walk through the house, is spending more can be good a lot of times, but if you have the wrong shell you're working with, you want to put it affordable out there. So like our goal is typically, these are harder to do too. Like controlling your cost and really controlling your scope of work um because i prefer just to rip them out and rip them back in but like this is you know there's some things that are going to hold back the sale price on this house and so we'll talk about that and that's why we're going very basic and i'll tell you what we typically would do and why we're not doing it on this one because that, that makes a huge difference on how you look at deals too because some deal won't look right and then you can cut it up five different ways and be like oh wait no it works this way and so you know, I hear all the time that there's no deals in the market. There's tons of deals in the market. I mean, we buy 15, 20 homes a month. So there is just about how you're looking at the actual deal. Price points too. And it also depends on the comp. Like if this was, let's say this area, but we, some comps sold for 550 and the rest are at 480. And we're trying to match that 550 comp. I'm going to bring in my better guys because it has to be. So it always comes down to what's the comparable saying. And then we spend a lot of times going through all the photos and I can like see things, I'm like, no, their texture sucks. Or like, so it kind of tells us what, how crazy we need to go. Um, we don't really have too much like, we don't make up our scopes, we just go right off, whatever the comps tell us to do is what we're doing. Oh, we do a lot of rentals, so we have about a thousand doors in Seattle. Um, we just closed on like a hundred unit SeaTac. Um, so we, we don't, and then we do, we build about 30 to 40 homes a year. Um, so we, we're very well versed in construction. So we build homes, we renovate them, and then we do apartments. We don't build any apartments though, it's just so expensive. So uh, we, we just renovate apartments. We do, we do all sorts of stuff. So we cold call, text message. We used to send like 80 grand a month in mail back in the heyday, because uh, we were doing like a couple hundred off-market deals a year. Uh, all of a sudden mail stopped working. <laughs> and all of a sudden that, that bill got real expensive real fast. Right. When you have three months of no deals, all of a sudden you're like, ooh, this is our cost shot through the roof. So ma mailing's good for targets. Like if you target your list really well, that's good. Volume wise, the response rate has gone down quite a bit. So, cause we used to target all sorts of stuff. And so now we're a lot more sniper on the, the deals. So yeah, once you get to a certain amount of doors, it gets very intensive. Um, and also it's just about resources and capital. Like we're just going after bigger stuff. Um, and then the rents on this would have been, it would have been a, a decent rental because you've been 320 plus 40, 360. Your payment is going to be 18. Your rents are probably going to be close. So it's, it's the, the cash flow after expenses is probably going to be a couple hundred bucks a month, which isn't bad. It's just not, it's a lot of work for a couple hundred bucks a month. Um, but I'm a firm believer, buy these, keep them for a year and 1031 them out. So I d I'm doing that with like a duplex right now. And it's a great, and cash flow is great, but I, I want to get it to eight. So I can, you buy the right fixer one, you can 1031 them. So I'm taking the two and going to eight. It just hit the one year mark. And so I'm listing it uh, this Friday, actually. And that okay. soil is not good back there. I can already tell. 
Yeah. Anytime you got a lot that's got weeds and grass like this, you got wetlands back there, which is gonna increase your development and permit cost and everything, like probably 25% on your build. And so you can tell by the grass a lot of times, like if you have a big lot and you see any kind of, like see how there's like cattails in the back? That's usually gonna be a pretty good sign that soil's not that good. Um, and it's kind of wet back there. Um, but these are on big lots. That last one was on a big lot too. And then the dadus are great, except for they're really expensive to build. To build a dadu is like 350 a foot, start to finish. And it doesn't make sense half the time. Like people, a lot of people bought these. They're like, I'm gonna build these dadus. And then they get the bids back. They're like, oh, wait, this is a lot of work for not, we had one in Ballard and we could easily put two in the back. That's what the neighbor did. And I was like, all right, we're doing this. And I ran the numbers and I was like, well, a bigger lot house sells for about 10% more than a normal house. And I started really looking, I'm like, I'm gonna make like a hundred grand more and keep this house for another year and a half and have a lot of risk in the market and all. And just, it's just, I was like, nope, fast is good. I mean, sometimes the middle plan is the best plan. The smaller the structure you have to build, the higher your price per square foot. So if you're building like a 5,000 square foot house, you're gonna be like 250 a foot right now. If you're building like a thousand, you're gonna be three. Cause at the end of the day, the kitchens are still kitchens. The bathrooms are still bathrooms. But, well, should we walk through? Yep, let's walk through. Okay. Like kind of, we're, we're targeting a price of like 475. It's gonna be about 10% below the high comp. Reason being is there's just some funk in the house that would cost a lot more money than the 30 grand and time and permits. So if we wanted to get to the optimal value, we would have had to wait four months for permits, right? That's four months of debt costs. Our construction costs right now, we're spending about 40, which we're actually almost dead on in budget on. Um, our, our remodel costs would have actually ballooned up to about a hundred bucks a foot because we would have had to rip the whole trusses out, reframe this whole system, insulate the whole house, uh, we'd have to also, because, because we're doing that, the city would have required us to take other things to new code, like the two by fours on the wall. And so we would have had to rip this all the way down to studs just to get the ceiling up. So it would have been at least 40K in cost and four months of hold. And for us to pick up 60K in value, it's way too much work. Your cash on cash return, it, it, these deals are all about how much cash you putting in, how fast can you turn it, rack your profit, get into another deal. So things that we've done, this is, we're keeping it super simple. So the first thing is we had a wheelchair ramp down. That's not gonna work for any size house, like, or any type of, for us to market the house. That's gonna limit our buyer pool so small, we didn't want that in there. So uh, we ripped this out, we put this in, this is coming out now. Um, I was just talking to Edgar about this. Um, and we're getting the porch more normal. In a perfect world, I would have ripped this off too, but that's just more cost. And so I think as an eyesore, but at the same time, it's still gonna cost us, by the time we do all the repair work and stuff, 1,500 bucks. And whether this is here or not, it's not gonna affect the sale and kind of come through. So the house actually has like decent bones. The problem is they're very short bones. Yep. Um, and this, the whole reason we're going super light on this is to, because of this situation going on here. This is weird. You don't want, if you're looking at any house, this is at 610, okay? For building code in the city of SeaTac, this doesn't even meet finishable square footage. It's seven foot in SeaTac. So those are things you guys wanna look at when you're buying properties too. So if you're ever looking at a basement, in the city of SeaTac, you have to have seven feet for you to even get drywall in there. They will not let you even drywall bonus space if you're below seven feet, which is international building code. In city of Seattle, it's six foot eight because they use city of Seattle code. So when you're looking at a property and you're gonna finish space and it's a little weird, you wanna see what building code they're actually referencing. Uh, reason I know that is in SeaTac, I learned a lesson a really hard way because I, I was at like six foot 11 and they had like a utility room all down there and everything. So we're like, oh cool, we'll finish this out. They made us tear the whole basement out because we were off by five inches. And I was like, but there's no bedrooms down here. There's no, and he's like, don't care. And then he made me move the laundry room that was already down there into my kitchen. So, always know where you're working because that can, you know, I hear a lot of investors go, oh, I went way over budget. And I'm like, well, yeah, that city's gonna require you to do this. I'm like, I didn't know that. And so you wanna know on any type of project what the permitting's gonna be, how long it's gonna take, because the debt cost can erode your deal very quickly. And then you wanna know what they're gonna require because as you're walking through a house, if you think you can do it a certain way and you can't, it could cost you double to do it the other way. 
and you guys, ways you can mitigate that is like working with an investor, you know, or like uh, me and Justin, where I can go, hey, this is gonna go this way. Working with the right brokerage, like people that know, uh, or, or working with a permit tech too. You know, there's companies like Yen Design that you can call them and you may not even have to hire them at the time if you're gonna hire them down the road and say, hey, you can ask them questions. So a lot of times I can pick up the phone, call an architect and say, hey, this is going on, is this allowed? And they'll say yes, no, real quick. They don't, I don't have to have them give me plans. They're just telling me, yes, that's gonna be a problem and I'm gonna need to do these things. Because um, all these things can trigger massive, massive costs. Yes, the two biggest things that will make you lose money is not having the right buy box. Like before you buy, define your buy box. What is your talents? What are you good at doing? What's your resources? What kind of capital do you have? And then what do you wanna manage? Like in the locations. That will get it there in itself. And then clear scope of work, people underestimate that. That is the most important piece, right? Contractors are not bad people, but a lot of them are not professionals. They were tradesmen that decided to go start a, a business. And in Washington, to get a, a contractor's license, you take no test. You fill out one form, you send them a check for 1100 bucks, and you are a general contractor, you can build a house. It's a joke, yeah. they should fix this. So they don't know half the time. And the other thing is, they're also running a business. If Justin thinks he can get a price down $10,000 on his salary to make him a little bit more money, asking the question, the contractors are gonna do the same thing to you. They're not your friends. And so you can always break it down backwards and that's what we do. We break down everything, any line item we put on Justin's budget or our budgets is logically broken down like flooring, we know, like before COVID, we were getting installed for $1.50 a foot. Now it's $2 a foot. And then we put an allowance next to that, which will be two bucks a foot. So we know it should be $4 a foot for install and materials. And we know where to get the materials for below $2. And we know $2 is a market rate. So when a contractor comes back and says, my flooring's under budget, I'm like, why? This is my allowance. This is what my install rate is. Is it different? And they're going, well, no, this actually, that's about right. I'm like, okay, so let's bring it. So like, I don't ever do the start high and I'm gonna start low and we're gonna meet in the middle. I do it all based on logic. And if my budget's wrong, then I'm gonna pay them more. And if their install rates are wrong, I either not gonna hire them or they're gonna come down on their price. And, it, and that allows us to scale and do a lot of projects because it's not this BS negotiation the whole time. The older the home, throw in the bigger the contingency, right? Because there's eras of building, like 1900 to 1930s are gonna be more crooked every time. I already know that. Uh, they're not w poorly built, they just have had bad drainage, the soil sinks, and they're gonna, s so like a lot of times, that's already in my scope of work when I'm buying a 1920s, because I'm like, I have an allowance for like two grand for leveling, because it's almost always gonna need to get done. Or like if I'm buying an 80s house, and even if the siding looks good, I know that siding is crap, because the 80s was the recession, right? We came off hyperinflation, we have high interest rates, they were building these homes so, so cheap on the outside. Kind of like what they're building now, to be honest. Cheap siding, cheap windows, cheap sheeting. And so I already know to have a contingency in for my siding on that because there's gonna be some water damage through the windows or something in there. And so it's also eras of houses or 50s. They're the best framed houses, but they have electrical and plumbing issues all the time. So it's, it, it's we kind of know the eras. And then also just make sure you're working with like people that kind of have a gauge on it. Because the other thing you don't want to do is miss a good deal because you add too many contingencies. You're like, oh, okay, well I got 40 grand in contingencies and my budget was 30. And it's, you, you'll kind of talk yourself out of a deal too. But um, yeah, if you're new, don't buy what you don't know. That's the number one way I've lost money in life, for sure. All right, so let's talk about this. This, and we did verify, this has plywood running through, right? So the first thing I would do if I walked into a low house is I would assume that this is maybe a little off. Not off, it is flush to the, this. Um, reason being is a lot of the, this is a 1930s house. 1930s and 1940s homes are the worst homes ever built. They're like after World War I, they are, they are the true recession houses. Uh, the framing is like a two by two on the inside. As you can see, there's not a whole lot. Like you see how your windows run flush. They're just poorly built. So if you're buying a 30s, 40s houses, you're gonna have the most amount of problems. Uh, so reason we didn't wanna do this. To do this would cost four months, like I said, we would have to have ripped this whole ceiling out and then collar tie the whole thing. 
and reframe it, re-roof it, and it was gonna be a substantial amount of cost. This market is constrained. If we were in Ballard and we could hit like a million bucks for a small house, then we would have looked at doing that more. So you always wanna look at what's your price per square foot that you're gonna to achieve too, because you do have a cost to build in. So the first thing we did when we bought this property is A, we got the trash out. There was people hanging around. We had to get the people out and get the, and there was two big sheds full of garbage. We just got that demoed out. And then we gave them a simple scope of work of just knocking out the base, the cabinets, left the bathroom alone. And then uh, we started, uh, we had them rip off some paneling and then we came out to bring meat with our tradesmen. The tradesmen were gonna really dictate how much money you were gonna have to spend on wiring and plumbing, okay? We have, the, and these are harder to remodel because this is what I call like a weekend warrior special where the guy's done some work but not others. And so you're trying to figure out your scope of work. Um, for example, this was the only heater in the house. That was something that we missed on our scope of work. And so we had to bring an electrician out and I was crossing my fingers, which it worked out, is the problem is when you start upgrading a bunch of heaters in a house, you gotta check how much power you got coming in. And if you don't have enough power coming in, you're rewiring this whole house. That's a $12,000 item for this house. So instead we're spending like 2,400 bucks because we had them troubleshoot it. So what we're doing on the cosmetic flips is we have our uh, mechanical people come out, we make sure there's no fire issues, right? We want him tracing all the lines. We wanna make sure that even though we're doing a light scope of work, that a homeowner can walk in, get an inspection and feel good about it. So just because we're doing light doesn't mean we're not doing safety. Um, so he's game through um, and that's when we noticed, he's, he called me, he's like, you're missing heaters throughout your whole house. So I was like, okay, great, that's, that's scope. Um, so it does happen to everybody. And then he's came through and tested all these. So all these outlets are grounded. These look old and they are old. These are probably 40, 50 years old. But the wiring isn't knob and tube. That's gonna be a fire hazard. It's a cloth wrath Romex wiring. That's not, it's not, you can run a house off that. I would say 40% of your friend's homes, unless they're new, have cloth wrap wiring in it. Whereas an electrician would come out here and say, your wiring's old, let's rewire it. And so that's what you have to also dictate the scope of work on these guys. So the electrician when I was talking, he's like, he's like, yeah, and you got this. And I go, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Like, cause I also have to know whether it works or not. Um, but because we had the ceiling height issue, we're, we're keeping our scope very simple. So what we've done so far, we've ripped that off. We put the flooring down. We did have to pay some for leveling cause the house was a little crooked in there. And then we've installed because of the budget that we're going, we sourced out floors. Typically what we put in a flip, like if this was a 550 flip, I'm gonna be putting in about $2 to $2 and 50 cents of floors. These were about $1.60, okay? So, and you guys, you can find this stuff for so cheap. Just because someone tells you you can't get it done for that price, that is BS. If you go on Home Depot and you have a small house, and we, we, I actually threw this out there to do on this one. Home Depot has leftover flooring and they will sell that to you for a, one cent per square foot. So if you have a rental property, they wanna get, it's like they have a thousand square feet left and they just gotta get it out of their warehouse. You can buy that for one cent. So there's, when people say they go over budget, it's usually their fault. As we go through, we're trying to get it presentable and shiny, right? So things like cabinets can go a long ways and they don't cost that much. This cost us 6,000 bucks for the cabinets installed and the countertops installed, right? So six grand got us a long ways. And so what we're trying to do is we're gonna give them a little bit of cork, but most of the comparables we're using don't have updated kitchens. So we're trying to give them a little bit of extra shine on it. Oh yeah, here's the sink. Sink, dishwasher, and then our fridge is going over here and then we're probably gonna add one more pantry cabinet. This is not how I would design my kitchen typically, but unless we wanna start replumbing and rewiring, if we move this over just a little bit, this is gonna trigger a ton of extra costs. And so we're giving them the nicer cabinets, the nicer countertops, but it might have a little bit of flow that's not in there. Uh, and that's okay, that's the theme of what we're trying to sell. It was about nine months in, resources got really, really bad. I actually hired a full-time phone guy that had no construction experience and I had him list out all these questions to ask each trademen. So what we were doing is we were pulling every permit that was pulled on any flip property in Washington. We grabbed the permits, we pulled the trades out and then we started interviewing them all based on pricing. So it depends on the trade, but usually what I do is, you know, I introduce myself and say, hey, we're an investor, just, you, you know, have you ever worked on a flip property before? And if they say no, you're gone that's not your guy already because they got to kind of understand it already um or if they say yes then i'll go through like my electrician i go okay hey i just want to run over some budgeting things with you well, i want you know i know everyone's busy 
you don't want to waste time, I don't want to waste time, I just can't, can we run over rough pricing, you don't need to quote it, and I then rattle off what, you know, I think it should be, right? So like, hey, you know, so typically we pay someone two grand for a panel swap out. And if the guy's like, well, I'm four, I'm like, okay. Like, cause if he's four on that, he's gonna be way more on everything else. But it's, and it's just about also talking to, um, you know, talking to investors and find out what they're paying. Um, and then I always just, if I don't know, like, so if I call a flooring company and let's say I don't know how much it costs to install the flooring, I'm gonna undercut it a little bit. I'll be like, hey, so you charge like, what, $1.50 to install? Is that about market rate? they be like, oh, no, I'm two. I'm like, okay, you know, so I just, like, you know, I heard this was market, or my last guy, even if you haven't done it before, my last guy was installing my floors at $1.50. And then, so you just kind of make it, don't ever make it seem like you're brand new though. You know, if you've never done this before, just say my last guy did it for this. Cause if they know you're new, they're going to come at you. Like it's, I mean, I watch it all the time. I, I mean, cause I call contractors for our clients. I'm like, I heard you charge them this much. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, you told me it costs this much. Well, they said they were okay paying it. <laughs> and I'm like, and then I look at the client, I'm like, why did you pay that much? They're like, well, that's the quote they gave. I'm like, did you not negotiate them? And then that's the client's fault. Like they already agreed to the deal. They can't back out after the furnace has been installed. So typically stuff on the JV deals that I'm looking for are like typically just more cosmetic turns where we're not, we might add a bathroom here or there, but we're trying to do no permits in and out quick. Turn, like even the last one I did with Justin, it was, we didn't need to add any bathrooms. Everything was where it needed to be, but we needed to do all the flooring, all the trim, all, and that one had some extras hidden in the walls that we had to fix, but more kind of quicker deals. I want to usually be in and out five to six months. Uh, well, I don't, I'd say each deal is different because this is going to take us like five to six months total, start to finish. Now, some wholesalers will bring us a deal in, they don't have the capital. And let's say I'm looking at it, I'm like, all right, well, this is what we can do. Let's buy it, trash it out, flip it up on market and see how high this gets bid up. And so we come in, we fund the whole thing. We get it more presentable. So it's not like we might cut back all the sticker, but we get, they call it like whole tail or whatever. You're basically just giving it back to the market with equity in it. Those deals we might walk in and think we're only gonna make 10 and whatever the market pushes it up is what we're gonna get. And those aren't a lot of work either for us because we're just running three people through. We're running a demo guy through, a landscaper through, and then we're back to market. So it kind of depends on how much work we have to do. But like a true cosmetic, we're probably trying to make around 20 on there. And, and half the time, you want to be making 20 anyways, because like Justin could have made 15 to 20 on each one of the deals without even having to wait for his money. So it's got to be better than that, or it's not even advantageous for the wholesaler to do it with us. And so how we structure deals like this, and that's always really important for how any deal is structured. Um, so what we do is we have a hard money company. So we have them fund the 75%. We put up the 25%. So the wholesaler's only paying expense on 75% of the project at a loan. And then we come up with the rest, the 25%. Uh, and then there's not, that's our equity in the deal. But, uh, so I have to come up with every part of the fund. So part of the agreement that we had set up was like, we had set up our LLC. Um, and it, where I was going to this is we're shooting a big video on passive investing and like how to, what to check for. So that'll be coming out on our YouTube channel. Like, hey, if you're gonna invest in a deal, here's what you need to do. Like, here's the terms you need to talk about. Here's where this could go wrong. Uh, here's the contracts that you should have in because there is so many things. You don't wanna just throw money in a random deal. You, you, it needs to be legit paperwork. And if the person doesn't have legit paperwork, then stay clear from them. Like if, they're, if you see their joint venture agreement, it looks like they got it off Google, then don't, 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 don't give them money. So, um, but there's so many ways you can do a deal. And that's, I guess, what it comes down to. But everyone in the real estate community just has to take care of themselves. That's how you last a long time here. Like, you know, just working with investors, talking to each other. You know, I call lots of even competitors. I'm like, hey, I'm jammed up on this. Can you help me out here? Um, you know, everyone just has to kind of work together because it, it is a tough business. Yeah, especially right now, it's really, margins are really compressed.